Hey everyone, welcome to Casey's Corner. You all have been so amazing and so inquisitive about the different topics that I share here on Casey's Corner. And to be honest, it's really an honor and a pleasure to find experts to talk more about the topics you want to be listening to. So my guest today is someone who is not only a registered nurse, but also a wellness coach and a life coach talking all about intuitive eating. But as much as we've talked about that in the past, what I really love is kind of her take on mindset and the way that we can approach eating and diet norms in cultural situations. So, you know, if you have that Italian mom who's always putting seconds on your plate or just, you know, family or friend situations. Talk about when you go out with friends and maybe you want to order dessert, but everyone is a little hesitant because of the way that it's perceived. Well, that's what we're going to navigate. So my guest today is Kristen McKenna. You can find her on Instagram at the strength to be me. And I can't wait for you to hear our talk. Check it out. I am so excited that you're hanging out with me, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Listen, it's been such a journey for me personally, and I've just appreciated being able to share that journey and have so many of my friends, family, followers, audience members reach out saying that they're kind of dealing with the same thing and trying to figure out how to ditch diet culture, how to have a healthier relationship with food. And I'm grateful that there are people like yourself that are really becoming such a valuable resource for us all. So take a second and tell everyone what it is that you do. Sure. Um, My name is Kristen McKenna, and I am a certified health coach and certified life coach. Um, I primarily help women stop dieting and heal their relationship with food. So what that basically means is that I teach people how to follow the principles of intuitive eating and gentle nutrition. Um, my, me and myself, I'm recovered bulimic. Um, I was also anorexic at one point as well. So I have a really, um, very, very, very long tumultuous history with disordered eating behaviors. Yeah. And even though, um, you know, when I tell people that some people feel like, whoa, 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 whoa," like I'm not that bad. Um, and it really is on a continuum, obviously all the way Mm -hmm. from like sort of intuitive eating and normal eating dieting, disordered eating behaviors, and like an actual diagnosable eating disorder. So they're all like sort of on the same continuum of similar like behaviors and, and mindsets, really. I mean, mindset is such a big part of it too, right? There's, there's so much, I feel like a revelation around mindset recently. There's all these mindset journals and it's becoming almost a buzzword, but to you really, what does that definition of mindset mean? Mindset is really everything when it comes to changing your relationship with food. Mm. Like it's so much more about what you think about what you're eating and how you feel about what you're eating and um, much, much less to do with what you're actually eating, if that makes any sense. Sure. So a big, um, you know, saying in this community is um, nothing on your plate will ever be as unhealthy as a bad relationship with food. Hmm. So yes, we definitely, um, you know, a lot of us are like either uh, you'll see a lot of registered dietitians or um, health coaches. I'm actually a nurse by training. Um, We obviously do focus on nutrition and we obviously believe in like the principles of good nutrition for health. At the same time, it's almost like how we feel and think about eating and food affects our health even more than the food we're eating sometimes. Totally. And I love, you posted something, I think it was maybe last week, um, about how your relationship with food has such an effect on your relationship with others and socially. I And I'd love to kind of talk about that idea a little bit too, because And just the graphic that you use, it kind of just made me think of that there's so many instances, right? And for me, it's like when you're out to dinner with friends and you want an appetizer, you want the mozzarella sticks or you want the lettuce wraps or something like that, right? And they're like, oh, you know, hey, listen, that's me. And luckily I have good friends and we're all eaters. But, you know, it's that, oh no, I'm just going to have a salad. Like how there are so many toxic social cues 
that really dictate the way we think of food or the way that we frame our brains around food. Tell me about kind of what was the methodology behind the post you made about that? Um, So I was actually having a really, really positive experience. I was at a coaching conference and um, part of that was a networking dinner, which in the past would have made me really uncomfortable and anxious. And I feel like I wouldn't have even been able to like focus on all these like great new social connections that I was making Mm -hmm. and just learning about all these new people and like having a great time. And the food was just like one little part of that. And it also was like amazing food because it was at this nice hotel, um, which was a bonus on top of it. But (laughs) in the past, I would have been so distracted. I would not have gotten any value whatsoever out of that uh, event at all. And honestly, what I was also thinking about was how when other women around me were practicing more intuitive, normal eating, that it affected me like really greatly. Yeah. It made you so feel comfortable, one, right? Yeah. So I have this one friend and like, she always um, is like the first person to like go get food at like a party. And like now sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm that person now. Like, I'm just going to break the ice. Like I'm going to go and, um, you know, show everybody and be like a living example of like, this is food. Food is okay. Food is great. It tastes good. Mm-hmm. And it's, part of this experience we're all having together socially. Totally. And I, I can hear your little one in the back. So I, you're a mom, right? <laughs> and, I, mean, um, I feel like, no, I feel like there's something to be said for moms right now. And I, I want to say it was a meme or another quote that I saw recently about how at kids' birthday parties, mom, it's okay to say yes to the cake. Right. And it's, and it's such a trickle effect. And I, I feel like I saw the quote and then I happened to go to a birthday party and I was like, I'm not a big cake person in general, but I was like, I'm just going to take the cake because I can see that everyone else is looking at mm-hmm. every other mom and seeing, Ooh, are they saying yes? Ooh, are they? And I mean, give us some tips to kind of help navigate that. Maybe you you're on the other side of it where you feel a little bit ashamed to want the cake. Yeah. Um, again, like certainly like listen to like what your body wants. Like if you really don't like cake, like yeah. this is not intuitive eating. It doesn't want to push us all the way to this other end of where we are now just saying yes to sort of like, uh, you know, if we want to call them bad foods that we would normally like restrict in the past. Um, we don't automatically just want to eat them just because, but if like you like cake and like everyone's having it and you want to participate and, you know, especially for me, like it's important for me to show my kids that it's okay for moms to eat the cake too. It's not just for the kids and the dads that this is okay, that you don't have to go, um, eat carrots instead of eating cake during cake time, um, if you want it. So I think like, you know, just the basis of intuitive eating, so much of it is just giving yourself unconditional permission to eat whatever sounds good to you at that time. Mm -hmm. So again, it's really, really, really going back to mindset with that unconditional permission to eat foods. And I mean, you know, detaching morality also from food is a huge thing. Like this good food, bad food. If I eat just a good, healthy food, well, that means everyone's going to look at me like I'm a good, healthy person and I look better. And if I eat the bad foods, people are going to associate me with being bad. So if we can get rid of like the good and bad thinking around food, that's also really, really helpful. Um, Because at the end of the day, the food is just food and it's just there to like sort of enhance the experience that we're all having together. And, you know, it really isn't either good or bad because everyone's going to have obviously a different definition of what foods are good and which foods are bad, so to say. Sure, sure. Do you think that um, intuitive eating becomes a little bit different or difficult or do you see differences around it culturally? Um, I would say I feel so I was working actually with a client that um, was living from and living in Mexico city. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I felt like when I was sort of explaining to her that like the media in the United States is now actually taking like really great steps towards more like inclusivity with yeah. body types. Like um, I went to Victoria's Secret to whatever buy. My right. Body. Isn't it great to see? In underwear. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, like now, like there are pictures of, you know, all different like body sizes and types, which is like, we're just making that like, teeny, teeny, tiny step forward. Mm -hmm. And we're just like finally starting to see like more inclusivity for, you know, models represented in the media. Right. And so we're just making those tiny baby steps. But I think that's also something that is happening maybe in the United States and not necessarily in other countries. So mm -hmm. in Mexico, I don't know that they were quite there yet. Yeah. Um, so certainly I think it depends on, you know, where you are in the world um, as to, you know, what sort of cultural influences are going to be there. And, you know, I don't, I can't say what it is for each sort of different um, person, but um, I felt like when I was telling her about it, she wasn't really seeing that in her culture as much as we're seeing it here in the U.S. And of course we have like a super, super long way to go. Um, yeah. to really actually be representing what people yes. look like <laughs> normally. Um, but we're like getting there step by step and we're just like starting to take those steps in that direction. Yeah, I think that, you know, for sure, I appreciate and love seeing the body diversity in advertising. I mean, I see it, like you said, Victoria's Secret for sure. Uh, Target's doing a good job with yeah. it. American Eagle does a great job with it. Even Abercrombie is making like a big pivot in their whole branding and everything. Um, for me, what I'm actually just more curious about is like when it comes to eating and when you're in a social setting, right? I just, I'm picturing like, Italian moms being like, you need to eat more, you need to eat more. Or, you know, we have friends who are Persian and the, the mom is always like, come on, you didn't eat, you didn't eat. So how do you suggest that someone kind of neatly navigate around that without feeling like, ooh, I'm kind of being preachy diet forward feeling, you know, I feel like there's a, a delicate balance. It's so hard. And, you know, if it's more like your close family, your immediate family, like certainly you can just set like an actual hard sure. boundary with them. And, but that's not really fun or always comfortable to do. You can just say like, you know, I'm not willing to discuss that right now. Or mm -hmm. like, I know what's best for my body, or I would appreciate, um, it makes me uncomfortable when you talk about eating and food and how much I'm eating. So if we could just like not talk about it, like that would really help me. Um, that's not always easy for like everybody to say if you're in a more social situation. Um, obviously, like just maybe thanking them for the offer and um, telling them how much you are enjoying the food and how great it has been. Nice. And, yeah. um, you know, just thanking them maybe really graciously for their hospitality and just assuring them that you have received you know, what they're trying to give out is love, you know, they're, they're yeah, trying to give oh, out sharing in love. So just letting them know that like you are feeling the love and you're accepting that and like that you're receiving it, I think is really I important. I like that. Oh, that's such yeah. a good tip. I like that a lot for sure. Um, there was something you posted again, I think it was yesterday for your motivation Monday that I just loved so much. I wrote it down. Where is it? Um, about holding a vision of yourself explain that to us. It's so cool. So what you're basically doing is when you embark on a new journey or have a new goal, you are at the start of your journey, seeing exactly what your life and yourself are going to look like in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so you're holding that person to be true. So if I'm starting my path, you know, from disordered eating to being an intuitive eater, I'm going to visualize what my life is like being an intuitive eater and I can see it and I can feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's like using sort of like a visualization process and accepting that that version of me exists. They exist in the future. Now I have no idea how I'm going to get there. I don't know what the path is going to be. I don't know how many times I'm going to fall and get back up, right. but I know that my end point is is this vision of myself that I have. And what's really great is that other people can do this with you. Okay. 
So you might not be strong enough to hold that vision for yourself. Like there have definitely been times in my life where people believed that I was going to accomplish things and I definitely did not believe it was possible, but they accepted me and already, they basically just said like, Kristen, you've already done it. Like you've already done it. I can see it. And like, I can see you in the future and you've already done it. I love that. that makes sense. No, it, it totally does make sense. And you know what's funny? Yeah, it makes sense to me because that's happened, I feel like, with just different goal setting that I've done for myself. And, you know, I've had cheerleaders in my corner even just telling me, like, you're already doing this show. Yeah, like, I, you know, I, I want to be a talk show host. They're like, you're already doing that. So yeah. I have to remind myself that um, I have to kind of hold that same vision of myself in the same light that others do. And I think that when it comes to any goal, whether it be a fitness or a wellness or a career goal, it's so easy to take that second and push the doubt away, right? Like, cause that's what you have to do in that moment. You have to take whatever it is that you're assuming is going to hold you back and push it away and just see what that future you actually looks like. Yeah, I definitely, you know, like I don't do this perfectly. I definitely get sucked into sort of that spiral of yeah. like, how is this going to work out? How is it going to happen? Um, but now when I start to do that, instead of sort of getting into the spiral, like negative spiral of like, how is this going to happen? I just stop and say like, what is an action step I can take right now to move me like one tiny little step closer to whatever the goal is instead of getting really like spun out on like the negativity and like doubt, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I totally can see that. Well, you're doing a great job of coaching and working with uh, clients. What is, what, or I should say, what are the different ways that you're working with individuals to kind of help them with their personal goals? So right now I offer um, like one-on-one -on -one wellness coaching cool. um, and you can find me on Instagram, obviously at the strength to be me. Um, you can also find me on Facebook if you happen to be there and prefer that. Um, I don't know if we can share something. At the I can put all the links in the, in the caption for sure. Yep. Yeah. So I mostly just work on one-on-one -on -one with people right now. Um, and basically that's over Zoom, unless you live in Frederick, Maryland, in which case you can come visit me in my lovely office here. Nice. Um, yeah. And we work together um, right now. I'm doing an eight-week program. Um, and that'll get you on the path to intuitive eating, healing your relationship with food, and never having to diet ever again. That sounds like such a fallacy, <laughs> to be honest, right? Like there's just, we are so ingrained with diet culture and feeling like there's always going to be some magic pill or some magic potion or something, you know? So kind of if, if you're already there as the teacher, what does it look like to have a before and after pi picture pop up or a, you know, so-and-so lost this amount in this many days? What does it feel like to be able to not have the, that curiosity and that like, oh, I wonder if this is the thing that actually works. What's that like? Because I'm not there yet. So tell us what it could be like. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's a, probably like a tiny bit easier because um, I know like when I restrict, I tend to take it to like an unhealthy level of okay. being, you know, really it, all the way to like an eating disorder. So for me, yeah. it's like, you know, is losing that 10 pounds worth me risking it, it won't necessarily happen right away, mm. but is it worth me risking my recovery from that? Um, just to be slightly less. So the, the goal weight that I've always had in my mind and the weight that my body actually wants to be is not a tremendous difference. Okay. And at some point I had to get to the place where I was like, is me struggling the rest of my life worth, you know, these 10 or 15 pounds that I'm just like, so, you know, super focused on. It's so funny that you say that. Cause that's exactly where I am too. I have this number in my head that is about 12 to 15 pounds away from where I what? am now. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with every single time that I get a Facebook ad, some Instagram sponsored story or something that pops through because, you know, unfortunately the way algorithms work when I do talk with different dietitians and nutritionists and everything, all that stuff gets flooded and fed my way. 
Luckily, it's a lot of good people like yourself, but sometimes it's it's other plans and you know programs. But um, I have done a lot of work to kind of get to that point where I'm like, I am comfortable and happy with where my body is right now doing what I'm doing, which is not restricting. It's just being more mindful about Mm -hmm. what it is and when I'm actually eating and moving my body and doing like all the right things. So is it worth doing, we'll call it a wrong path of a diet just to try and get to that menial number that probably doesn't mean much. Right. And I think that that's something that's so important. I'm glad you said it. And for those watching, like I feel it as well. You, the number game is such a mind trip that we all have the power to get beyond. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and it's easy for me to say, and I hate to put even numbers on it. Like but that's just personal for me. No. And that's how I, yeah, that's how I am. Is the difference between probably what my set point is and what my um, eating disorder sort of like way of thinking really wishes me to be at the same time, you know, not everybody can be like body positive, like right out the gate. And that was definitely me. Like I was willing to heal my relationship with food and gain weight, but like, I still wouldn't say I'm like all the way into body positive and like a great movement that has helped me in my journey has been this idea of like body neutrality, mm. which is just like, Explain I don't Explain that a little that. bit for those who might not know yeah, that term. Yeah, of course. Um, and I hadn't heard of this until probably within the last year. Yeah. It's basically just like, I love my body for what it does for me. And, but my primary focus is not what it looks like. Yes, I take care of it and treat it well and whatever I do my hair and my makeup and things like that. Um, But I never have any negative feelings toward my body. So I don't hate my body. I don't dislike my body. Do I necessarily always feel like 100% confident and want to like put it out there? No, I'm just not there yet. I hope one day I will be there, but it was such a great stepping stone to know like this was a um, option where I didn't have to necessarily be in a bad body image place. And I didn't have to go all the way from that all the way over to the other side of being like body positive because I just like wasn't and still am like a little iffy. And like dancing around in your bikini on Instagram and TikTok, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I like, feel yeah, maybe- I feel it because yeah, I'm I'm the same. Yeah. I'm I'm comfortable. I'm not a hundred percent there yet, but there are days when like if I feel great, if and you know, like everyone has the good body days, right? When they're like mm-hmm. depending on where you are in your cycle or whatever, when you're like, oh, my body looks great. And that's when I feel comfortable and confident to put a little bit more out there. But yeah, you're right. I'm not that uh that rah, rah, look at my rolls and cellulite kind of person yet. Maybe I will be, but I'm completely fine in this little comfy, cozy section that I'm in. Yeah. I've definitely thought about it, you know, and there's good that comes from that. Like, obviously we're seeing more people on social media, like sharing more of what normal bodies look like in terms of maybe like stretch marks or like you know, I just, I don't even have stretch marks for my kids, but I have like a ton of extra skin just because my belly was literally like, you know, really out there. My babies were like almost nine pounds and wow. you know, they just like stuff like straight <laughs> out. Um, you know, and I think it's great to put it out there and show it because like, you know, it always makes me feel better when I see it. Right. I hope that at some point I can get to the point where like I can share that. Um, but I'm just not quite ready for that yet. So I just love that there is this landing place for me. There's this landing place of like, just being okay, being inside your body and your body just becomes like the least interesting thing about you. Hmm. That's so, that's such an interesting way to put it. Yeah. I really like that where it's not about what it is. It's not about the vessel. It's about what's inside really. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That was such a well, well said answer, Kristen. Thank you. (laughs) I (laughs) try. uh, Yeah, no, it was great. Great. I want to ask you kind of what's coming next. What's something exciting in the pipeline for you? Is there anything that we should be on the lookout for? 
<laughs> yes. So I actually just did like a three hour photo shoot today, which was Ooh, super fun. That's exciting. Um, so I will be launching a website next month um, and it should have all my um, sort of new fun pictures. Um, and then you'll see some of those new pictures on Instagram. I also have a Facebook group. Um, yeah. And I'm accepting more clients right now. So if anyone is interested, um, you can definitely reach out to me and I'll get you started. Awesome. And I'm in that Facebook group and I love the content that you post in there. It's so, um, there's so many things that I think there was one prompt that you put in there about breakfast and, you know, how many people grew up being afraid of breakfast. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so guilty of that. I was totally afraid of breakfast. And then, well, and you know what, let me ask you kind of your opinion. There's been this huge push towards fasting and intermittent fasting and how it's the game changer that no one ever thought about or whatever. How do you see, do you see intermittent fasting becoming part of a disordered eating habit? It definitely can put you at a higher risk for mm. um, disordered eating behaviors as any diet will, sure. because it is asking you to override your natural hunger signals. And every time we override those signals of hunger, we get further and further away from our intuition. Okay. And you know, if you have been dieting for a really long time and you stop, and it was definitely true for me, you literally have no idea what hungry and full feel like anymore. You know what like starving feels like, you know what like way over full and sick feels like, but like all those little steps in between you just like lose touch with what each of those feels like. Mm. And that's really like the danger zone with, you know, and using any sort of dieting or intermittent, intermittent fasting included. Okay. Now, like, you know, if you're going to do like a little 12 hour fast, that's very reasonable for most people. Like, sure. let's say you stop eating at 7 p.m. and you start eating again at 7 a.m. Right. You know, most of us are doing that naturally. Right. Um, or even longer than that, if, if we don't happen to, you know, feel hungry, depending on yeah. what we eat the day before, I find like what I'm eating the day before definitely plays into like what I'm eating the next day Okay. in terms of like, if I eat a little too little, yeah. then maybe I'm more hungry. If I went a little overboard, it's not like a huge deal anymore. Maybe I just naturally feel slightly less hungry the next day. Um, but anytime we're really like setting really, really tight limits on anything, I feel like that's putting us at risk. So yeah, it really depends on how you feel. Like if you wake up in the morning and like you have a cup of coffee and it's like three more hours till your eating window. And now you have to sit there and be hungry for three hours. Right. Like that's, that's probably not very good. Um, right. Yes. Drink water and coffee and like that might help a tiny bit, but if you're hungry, nothing but food is going to actually help. So true. I know. I love those like myths of if you feel hungry, drink a bottle. Yeah. If you feel hungry, have a bottle of water. It's like, this is why we're all messed up. Yeah. <laughs> if you're hungry, you should eat some food. No, it's so great. Um, one question I'm going to wrap it up with. I've been asking a lot of my guests. This is if <laughs> you could go back to be any age growing up, when would you go back to be? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I because it's fun or so I could change like the trajectory of my life. However you see fit. Oh, well, I don't know. Cause then I wouldn't be who I am today. Like this will sound all of the sort of bad, terrible things that I've been through are what make me a good coach. And I couldn't be who I am today without all of those experiences. Do I want the next person to necessarily go through all those experiences? No. Do I want my own kids to go through those experiences? No. Right. But at the same time, they have shaped who I am and how I view things. And, you know, being able to come from this really, really unique perspective and understanding is like the blessing that came from so many curses. Mm. Like so I don't know, maybe I'd go back to being like, jeez, ah, like 18, going to the right. beach with my boyfriend and eating bagels. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what advice would you give 18 year old Kristen? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't even know what would he, but be true to yourself and don't worry so much about what everybody else thinks and 
how you think you look to other people, like care more about how you feel and what experiences you're having for yourself. It's a good one. We'll go back and tell her in the, in place them back to the future. <laughs> go <tell her. laughs> Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. Um, I will for obviously be following along on Facebook and on Instagram. We'll link everything of yours below and maybe you'll come back soon and give us some more tips in the future. Absolutely. Okay.